Tom Abbott with Parnum & Associates. Today I'm going to be talking to you about defending sex crimes. And we've got other videos that cover um, the ins and outs of different sex crimes, so today my discussion is just going to be limited to what you need to be looking for in choosing an attorney um, to represent you if you're charged with these kinds of crimes. Now, the big one to remember is that in most sex cases, um, there is unlikely to be a lot of physical or forensic evidence. Uh, most of these crimes are uh, crimes against children. Um, they may have searched for a, uh, or conducted a rape kit, uh, searched for physical uh, and forensic evidence, but a lot of times due to a delay in the outcry, you're not actually going to find those things. And so what that boils down to is that most of what the jury is going to hear and make their decision upon is going to be the testimony of the witnesses involved. Now, in Texas, um, a charge can be legally sufficient based on the testimony of one witness if that testimony meets all of the elements of the crime charged and the jury believes that witness beyond a reasonable doubt. So this becomes very important from a defensive standpoint because one of the main issues that you're going to have to deal with in most of these cases is going to be the credibility of the complainant and possibly the credibility of anyone uh, that she told that story to because under the Texas Outcry statute, the first uh, person 18 years of age or, or older uh, that the offense was relayed to is allowed to testify to help shore up uh, the child witness who maybe due to their age and inexperience is going to have some difficulties testifying in a court of law. So what you need to be looking for <clears throat> in terms of choosing your attorney is what do they have in terms of resources available to them. Um, one of the things that we always do uh, in our uh, sex cases is we get our experts to go review the CAC video, um, and look for any kind of cues in that video, psychological, uh, physical, anything that they give off that might indicate that this person, this child has been coached and told what to say. Um, this is very labor intensive. Uh, we have very good doctors that assist us with this, um, and they will review the case from that standpoint, compile a report, and tell us what issues there are on credibility. This can be um, done by looking at the CAC video, uh, any therapy uh, records that you can get a hold of, uh, if the child went to any kind of therapy, um, any school records, things like that. Sometimes, you know, looking at a case, you find out, well, the child was actually doing really bad in school, and they're getting into a lot of trouble, and all of a sudden this allegation comes out. And the question then becomes, is it an allegation designed to shield the child uh, from any repercussions for their own actions, or is there something really here? And that's what you need these experts to do all of this review and to you know, be able to uh, assist the attorney in cross-examining um, that complainant. Um, the other thing when you're dealing with credibility is you need someone who's experienced in these matters because cross-examining a child witness or um, any person really that has a claim of sexual assault is a very, very delicate matter. You don't want to make the jury angry um, based on the questions that you're asking. So while you have to be firm with that witness, you also need to appear to be you know, kind and considerate of that witness in a way that you might ne not necessarily have to deal with other witnesses and other complainants. Um, so it's very important that you hire someone uh, who has experience in this kind of an area um, if you've been charged with this kind of crime. Now, um, the second issue uh, that you've got to be aware of um, is how are the negotiations structured? Um, a lot of times with the vast majority of these cases, they are going to be tried. Um, the state may make an offer, but you know any kind of um, sex crime is typically going to have 
registration requirements that come after. So while the DA may be offering you uh, five years deferred, um, that's not necessarily as good as it looks on the front end because after that probation is complete, you know, that defendant is going to have to register for either 10 years or possibly even the remainder of their life on the sex offender registry. And that will carry and follow through with them every time they apply for a job, it's going to come up. You know, there are uh, additional criminal penalties that they can be subjected to if they fail to register in the correct and timely manner. Um, and so it's very important that during any plea negotiations, not only is your attorney trying to get the charge resolved in such a way to either get rid of or limit uh, those issues as much as possible, but also making sure that the DA stays in touch with their complainant. Um, one of the things that occurs over the course of these trials is that, you know, once the charges come down, it may be a year or more before you actually get to trial. Um, and during that time, the DA's office, obviously they have other cases, sometimes they don't keep in touch with their uh, complainant. And this can be important to kind of, as you're negotiating with the state, pick out instances, things that you need clarification on, um, so that the DA is constantly going back to the complainant. Uh, as much as you can possibly make them. This can be helpful uh, from a defensive standpoint because at some point this complainant, if they are in fact lying, will probably slip up and or admit to the lie. Um, this is very helpful because then this can result in a dismissal of the charges or a reduction of the charges. Um, both of which can be you know, very helpful to the defendant because a dismissal, obviously they're not getting convicted of this because the DA's figured out that they've been sold a line of uh, horse manure. Um, but on top of that, if you can get the charges reduced to something that doesn't require registration, that is definitely something that the defendant should consider um, before deciding whether or not to go to trial. Because if they go to trial and they lose, they'll have to register. But if you work out a plea deal where they don't have to register, maybe it's worth it to them. Now, the third thing that you've got to look for in an attorney is someone who is experienced with appellate law. And the reason I say that is that these cases always have issues. Um, most of the time, like I said, it's being testified to through the outcry statute. Um, in order to have that occur, the uh, court is required to conduct some informal hearings on the record to make some determinations about whether or not this outcry can come in. Um, and, you know, if it's not done correctly, um, then it could potentially, the, the conviction could be overturned on appeal. Now, the, the reason I say you need someone experienced in appellate law is because you need an attorney that knows what, when to object and how to object. Um, you cannot raise anything different at the appellate court that you did not raise at the trial court. So it's very important that whenever an attorney is objecting, that they preserve the error correctly. Um, if they object on one basis, but the real answer was a different basis, you can't then go to the appellate court and argue that other basis. You have to have addressed it to the trial court at the time. And this is why you need someone who's experienced in appellate law because they will be more familiar with those phrases. They will know what to say, when to say it. Um, and they are very, very uh, focused on preserving a record because if the trial court makes a mistake, the trial is going to continue on and a conviction may come down. That can be dealt with on appeal if it was properly preserved. So it's very important that you hire someone who has some experience in appellate or post-conviction law.